To the DCS sit rep. I'm your host, Prickly Hedgehog, and today we discuss the preliminary implementation of multi threading into the DCS World Core engine, at least that is for open beta. That's right, after years of hints, discussions, demands, and even threats from the community members, support for multi-core CPUs and modern GPU architecture has finally arrived to DCS world. Oh my god! Personally, I believe this is one of the most significant developments for the game to date, bringing it into the 21st century and up to par with similar platforms and competing genres where gamers are looking for fluid visual experiences while enjoying real-world environments. This is a huge challenge, of course, for flight simulation developers, as graphically generating rich real-time worlds on a large scale requires processing power that traditionally hasn't really been practical or even possible without degrading PC renderings to single frame rate experiences, which is simply not tenable. However, with the rapid development of high-end GPUs and CPUs lately, capable of crunching mass quantities of data, what could be dreamed of only 20 years ago has now become something of a reality. DCS World has widely been hailed as not only the most realistic combat flight sim experience out there, it's also one of the most visually impressive as well, with clips and footage from the game regularly being confused for real world events. ED have now unlocked the key to not only enhancing that standard, but also expanding the accessibility to it for a wider variety of potential and existing users. The caveat though, like all development of this nature, is that at this stage it is still very much an early access standard, and with the plethora of different PC systems available, individual results will vary. Let's look though at what ED have stated about their multi-threading software and what it means for our PC's hardware and architecture when running the game. ED reminded us that in order to access the multi-threading features, you will need to launch the game under a new folder titled binmt, which is located in your DCS open beta main root folder. Within that folder, you will find a DCS executable, which will run the game with the multi-threading features turned on. If you haven't been doing this, you're probably not running the game under multi-threading, which could be why you're not seeing performance boosts as expected. Although, as I said before, system variance is also a contributing factor to outright performance. ED then went on to explain that multi-threading is as follows. It is essentially a programming technique which allows multiple threads to exist within the context of a single process. A thread is an independent path of execution within a program, and multi-threading allows a program to perform multiple tasks concurrently, improving performance. The challenge, though, is preventing conflicts within that architecture where tasks are completed before others, generating deadlocks, or what is known as race conditions. As a real-world example, I saw Razbam's Mesh to Metal artist mention that the radar developer has managed to isolate a single core to run the F-15E's radar, again as a broad example of task division under multi-threading and multi-core support. Despite all this, as I said, some people may not experience performance gains, and ED addressed this issue as follows. There are several reasons for this. 
including your graphics processor or GPU limited. That is, you have a powerful CPU, but the GPU is holding it back. Multi-threading is most effective in large missions with many units. And you'll recall this where large unit appearance, for example, the launching of dozens of cruise missiles could slow some missions down or even ground assets like slow moving people. In smaller missions, CPU calculations are not a gating performance limit and therefore you won't see major performance gains there. They advise that mission creators will still need to consider unit count when generating assets in missions and in the game. And that the bottom line is that the more assets you put into the mission, it will have an impact on performance. I have often thought that Reflected needed to remove some assets from his mission starts, especially the random soldiers wandering around aimlessly on the flight line in his F-14 campaigns. But that's just a small gripe. Older CPUs, which generally have less cores, will probably not see as much of a gain as modern ones, which have larger numbers of cores and threads. And as I said before, make sure you are launching the game from the open beta bin MT executable. They went on to say that indeed some older CPUs, as I said, with only a few cores, might actually see a performance degradation because the software is designed to spread load across cores. And if you don't have lots of cores, well, the software basically isn't optimized for your CPU, kind of the reverse of what we've had in the past, where the software was taking advantage of less cores and wasn't able to be optimized with multi-core. At this time, ED is evaluating the introduction of multi-threading. So this is why it's optional for those interested in running it, and they can then assess customer community feedback. How long it remains in that state will depend on customer feedback and public test results. They explain that about half the P cores are dedicated for graphics needs for up to 16 threads on P cores. The remaining P cores are used by the main logic threads, sound engine, and auxiliary thread pool that occupy all available space. E cores are used only by the resources streaming pool that has no limits. The P core E core is probably worthy of a separate discussion thread. Uh huh, yeah. <laughs> There's no guarantee that multi-threading will fix GPU bottlenecking per se, but it might help overall application performance by offloading non-GPU related tasks to a separate CPU thread. And that's one of the keys of this whole system. One question that came up was, should I enable simultaneous multi-threading and hyper-threading on my motherboard? Well, the short answer is yes, unless you have a chipset that has more than 32 threads which currently is not supported by the system that ED is implementing, and you should therefore disable it. The bottom line is, though, expect more bugs and potential crashes with this new system as ED implements it, and a broader range of players interact with it. Remember, it is open beta after all. It's a testing platform. Now, bug issues will likely be a trigger word for some users who bemoan issues with the core game and modules needing fixes which has been a focus of ED's attention in recent years and brought about patch launching changes. They used to be almost weekly. Now they are roughly monthly. It's a bit of a catch-22, of course. As I said previously, the community has been crying out for multi-threading and core support for years, but also bug fixing and core stability. I'm sure the topic is a can of worms. Plenty of people will have an opinion on in the comments section below. But based on the loose survey I conducted today, it appears overwhelmingly that most people have experiences that are generally of an improvement in performance, whether it's a moderate or a slight, that seemed to be the predominant thing that there was a moderate, excuse me, performance improvement. Now it's unscientific, of course, and I can attest to a visual improvement and an FPS rate boost, but it's early days in terms of accessible performance improvements. There's a whole topic in itself in this area, but notwithstanding bugs that exist and new ones being introduced, in simplistic terms, anything that improves the overall game experience and FPS boosts is a critical one, and I think it's a step in the right direction for most community members. Naturally, there will be those who disagree with me or maybe having negative results with this implementation, which doesn't endear them to the multi-threading experience. But remember, this is what we've been asking for for years, and it needed to happen, and it's going to take some tweaking yet. Remember too, the caveat early on, ED stressed this was the first iteration of the system. Expect further developments down the road. To recap, as I said, I believe overall this is a crucial and massive update to DCS World, which has been long needed 
to embellish the visual experiences and performance improvements needed to get the best out of the game. It's a crucial piece in the puzzle for those wanting a dynamic campaign, which has been asked for for years and is still being worked on, which is another of the major single player demands too for DCS World. It opens up therefore a lot of opportunity for different types of players within the community, crucially including content creators and third party developers. And I still think the game is the best visual simulation experience of any of the flight sims I've played in recent times. Let me know what you think thus far of the introduction of multi-threading to the game this week and whether it's something you find a winner or not. And if not, tell me why. Quickly copy, push channel 12, pop two. Let's turn to other news from the newsletter this week and that was the revelation that both the Hornet and the Viper are close to feature complete. Yes, believe it or not, after many years of being in development, they are close to feature complete. Both aircraft are expected to receive major radar updates, which will provide more realistic behavior and improvement between detected and tracking of objects, look down performance, and the effect of azimuth and bar settings. They're going to add new 3D pilot models with lifelike animations, as well as mission editor planners and digital transfer cards. There will also be new bomb fuse support for programmable fuses, such as airburst options. Pretty cool. The Hornet is currently undergoing an update to its flight model and flight control system adjustments to the external lighting and loft cues for GPS guided weapons. For the Viper, it will receive some unique additions like the velocity search radar mode, additional data link functions, and a radar warning receiver handoff mode. Even out of early access status, both aircraft will, as is expected, continue to see development and support in perpetuity. These two aircraft remain some of the heavy hitters as popular modules, with Spudknocker recently devoting an entire video to the draw of the Hornet to community members as the all-rounder and perhaps king of DCS World still. While there is some subjectivity to what draws players to a particular module, it's hard to deny the breadth of flight experiences that the Hornet can bring to the game and for the user. But with the Viper close to feature complete also now, you can throw a blanket over the two in a race as you pare down the differences. While many rate the Viper for its BFM capabilities, which are no doubt legendary in the real world, as a recent fighter pilot podcast guest said when discussing his experience as a MiG-29 exchange pilot when going up against the Hornet, you had to mind your P's and Q's around the Hornet, he said. A lot of these comparisons in the BFM arena, while interesting, are often pointless. <laughs> the one saying I heard recently from a real world perspective is that if you don't want to get shot down in a BFM, then don't go to the merge. This topic might also perhaps be the subject of another video. We'll see how things go. There's a lot going on in DCS world right now. Now, speaking of other topics and developments and things going on in DCS world, we need to mention here the Apache, which was also part of this week's newsletter, which continues to make major progress with ED focusing, they say, on polishing and bug fixes. The emphasis is on tuning to the damage model, engine startup issues and fixes to the flight model, including the stability augmentation system or SAS and hold modes which are the priority before the team makes strides in the area of adding new features for the Apache. These features that are unhindered by any bugs and will include some cool features for the helicopter include the auxiliary fuel tank in order to carry more cannon rounds, the addition of the radar-guided Hellfire missiles, AGM-114L, the improved data link modem, longbow net, fire control radar, and the laser spot tracker. Also, we shall see an animation for the engine nacelle cooling doors and the wipers to remove raindrops from the windshields. So lots of complex systems being introduced and of course aesthetic ones as well to what really is one of the more popular modules introduced to the game recently, certainly one of the most popular helicopters. With the introduction of the multi-threading, I'm going to leave the sit rep here for now just to percolate. I should add that I made sure I had deleted a lot of old DCS files. In fact, I inadvertently deleted a lot of saved stuff as I was cleaning up my install for preparation with multi-threading. And I did have to make an adjustment to my FPS lure file as my GPU was, for whatever reason, capped at 60 FPS, which was not awful given how high the settings were, but was a little bit intolerable when I was expecting somewhat of an increase in FPS. 
Now that might be the subject of a separate video on how to do that, but I'll give you uh, the information that I got from Juice from the Air Warfare Group who showed us how to do this uh, about a year or so ago, and that description will be in the video below. And if it's something that helps you, I hope you find that beneficial. Like I said, it's a pretty easy fix. Uh, for whatever reason, the default of 185 doesn't necessarily work with every system. I had a major boost, even at idle, it was sitting at uh, 140 frames per second or so. Uh, of course, all of these things are relative and uh, don't get too enamored or overly excited by FPS. There's more going on here than just FPS. And I think my initial impressions of what we're seeing with this update, this latest patch, for open beta shows a considerable aesthetic improvement and general um, improvements to the way in which the game runs, even at very, very high settings, which is quite pleasing to see. It bodes well for the future of this particular system as it gets tweaked, morphed, and evolves in the game. So stay tuned for more on this topic. There is also a lot of stuff in the changelog this week, which I think is likely worthy of a separate video. So that might come out a little later this week. In the interim, I want to thank everyone for tuning in again to the DCS Sit Rep. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Consider the super thanks button if you want to support the channel just a little bit more. It helps it keep chugging along. And in the interim, we'll see you next time on the DCS Sit Rep. Thank <laughs> you.